This video is brought to you by the Logitech Lightspeed wireless range of keyboards, mice and headsets, the benchmark in wireless gaming performance. Hello and welcome back once again to another DF Retro Play. I'm joined uh, by my good friend Audie Zerli. I'm here. It's very hot. We took that Nelly song uh, very literally today and uh, playing some Famicom. Yes, this is like the follow-up to the Rocket Knight video where we try to play while burning up in the summer heat. But uh, today we have three Famicom games for you to enjoy. Uh, specifically, we're focusing on three games that we feel are very technically impressive and two of which are kind of unknown, one being a late, very rare Famicom game, which is what we're playing here, the other a homebrew game released later, and the third a very well-known but amazing Sunsoft title. So let's get started, Audi. What is this game? This is Moon Crystal from Hect, or Hector, as they're better known as. All right, Hector, the uh, well-known developer. Good friend. Yes, Our good friend. yes, of course. Uh, do you know any other Hector game? No. So they did Formation Z on the Famicom. They did the uh, Great Deal, which was a gambling game, and uh, not much else, really. Wow, okay. Well, that's good to know. And uh, yeah, so these cutscenes, though, I think earlier we were looking at this, and you commented on how... They actually resemble sort of a PC Engine CD it game. Gets very, it, it gets murky, but it's very close to the territory of like a PC Engine CD game with some of these cutscenes. That's right. We don't have to watch all of this though, Audi. I think no. not all of our viewers are going to be interested in enjoying the story here of Moon Crystal. That's Something, a cool title screen effect. Pretty cool though. effect on title screen. Actually, they saw the entire opening cutscene, so they had 1992, no 1992, by the way, you saw that. Yes. Uh, this was produced in very low numbers. It's one of the rarest Famicom And you got it recently. I, you got a real copy, which yes. we're showing right here. I have been interested in this game for many years due to my interest in cinematic platformers like Another World and Flashback. So I always wanted to have this because this was featured in EGM back in 92. Oh, well, here we go. Okay, <laughs> this is actually, we got we to gotta comment right here. This is what, to me at least, makes this game so darn impressive is the animation quality. Very fluid. Just it, the it, running and jumping. Looks almost rotoscoped. This probably is, in fact, Try rotoscoped. turning around. So you notice they even have frames, not only that, when you're running, but when you're walking slow and turn around. Yep. They just, they actually have an extra frame to show them turning around. So they have two different turning around animations. So this is super smooth jump. Oh man, it's so, it's unusually well animated for a game on this system, I think. And that's really what stands out to me. But beyond that, obviously the backgrounds look, look great. It does have slopes. They do have, there's some slopes here. <laughs> I know you're very happy about that. Uh, yeah, I was interested in this game actually since childhood because this was featured in EGM, believe it or not, in 92. Uh, it was in some kind of like coming up section. Oh yeah, that's right. So it was announced for a uh, US release, but never came out, uh, probably due to the Super Nintendo coming out pretty soon at that time. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, a lot of these games, there were some late NES releases in North America and Europe, but uh, not too many, and they are also rare, probably due to lack of success. Because yeah. 16-bit was the new hotness, but still... Can appreciate a good game like this. I think it was supposed to be, if I'm not mistaken, because it's been a while since I looked up this information, uh, but I think it was supposed to be published by DTMC in the US. Uh, oh, okay. Do you know which other games DTMC did? I can't remember, no. Okay, so DTMC, uh, I think they actually were connected to Hector, to be quite honest, because they have quite a few Hector games on their list. Hector but, sounds like a mob boss to me. Yes, or your neighbor. Uh, but Hector, uh, or rather DTMC, or sorry, uh, did a game called Lester the Unlikely, and I think that was the uh, end of the company. Yeah. They put a lot of money into that, and uh, kind of share some similarities playing a rotoscope. Can you kind imagine of... betting the farm on Lester the Unlikely? Well, I mean, as a connoisseur of bad games, yes, I can. I spent a lot of money on bad games. That's true, actually. <laughs> this is why we're announcing the sequel to Lester the Unlikely on this uh, episode exclusively. Good to know. Oof. Oh, yeah, you get the double jump. That looks great. Yeah, so you have some upgrades here. You can upgrade your weapon. Uh, here's a boss. Okay, this is the first the boss then. Yeah. Yeah, again, so. he's fairly well animated. Yeah, it's it's simple. Nice expressions. Like, it's really... The only thing that really showcases this as you can tell it's a Famicom game is the plain background here, which is sort of that blue color. Right. But the actual tree quality and everything else, it looks really good. 
But I think the next level kind of solves that, at least initially. Yeah, the levels are very different from each other. Uh, there's a lot of variety here, so it's not too bad. The backgrounds, though, are probably the weakest among like the graphical uh, tricks tricks in this game. Though I like this, how they have the different parallax layers there. Right. Kind of like Ninja Gaiden. It's very inspired. Geeky. I, yeah. <laughs> when, I, uh, when I was in Japan a few years ago, I went to Beep, which uh, people who are oh, in yeah. Akihabara would be familiar with. I was talking to one of the employees there that I know, and he was talking about this game, but he kept saying Licky, Licky. So Licky, I think, gives the character a, kind of another uh, <laughs> char uh, characteristic. So you but can practice your Japanese in here. <laughs> oh, too, too fast. fast. But look at this scene. I think this okay, is yeah. very close to what we'll be seeing on early PC awesome. Engine uh, CD. Yeah, I agree. Scene. It's really just the colors that kind of. There's a limitation limitless. on colors, yes. Because the PC Engine is basically a Famicom Plus in terms of hardware. Yeah, it just has a really advanced uh, graphics chip that can. Its color capabilities, especially, are quite amazing. I think we've seen enough, though. Yeah, yeah. But, but you see, see here. Yeah. So there's there's multiple things going on. So we've seen plenty of this line scrolling effect on NES or right. Famicom. And the, don't leave the screen so fast, though. Uh, but so that's that's not necessarily new. But there's more going on here that I really like. Right. So first of all, uh, notice how they actually managed to have something obscure the player sprite. Like, yeah, there's that's, a foreground element. That seems like nothing, but it's actually, you know, I th I think that's that's an uncommon thing to see on the system because it actually has to, you have to be able to collide with it. Well, not collide with it, but be obscured by it. it you can see how the little scan line there trick is, is a, sort of flashing yeah. by his arm. So obviously they're doing something there. And also the water, which is scrolling independently and in the, in the different direction from the from clouds. From the sky, yeah. It actually shimmers. So just sort of flashing the different pixels on and off there to create this effect of shimmering water. So you have these smooth scrolling clouds, the shimmering water, this bridge that sort of obscures the character. It's a really nice scene. It's amazing looking. But then you it? get here and I, I, I can already imagine the programmers are like, oh, we really <laughs> want to have scrolling clouds here, but they could have done maybe animated tiles, but uh, yeah, I guess it just didn't work out. So they were showing off there for a moment and this still looks good, of course, but Clearly, the main draw is this crazy animation. What's interesting about this game to me is just, as I mentioned, I was such a big fan of Flashback and Another World especially, and Prince of Persia to a certain extent. But this is like a Japanese take on that genre with actual kind of classic gameplay. So you have a mix here of like the rotoscoped animation, the climbing, and the so puzzle challenges. You're kind of right. and But weirdly, it also reminds me somehow of the Aladdin game from Capcom. Which yeah, also yeah. has this mantling features. Uh, it has a focus on smooth animation. Uh, but obviously, you know, that ha also you can jump off the heads of your enemies, which is really fun, by the way. Yes, I love that Capcom Aladdin game more than the Sega one. I agree, actually. It's really good. <laughs> Fighting well, words, I know. But the Master System version, though. Damn, oh, dude, it's getting... you're getting careless now. Yes, I'm talking and playing. And it's I usually difficult. don't talk. It's so difficult, it's, yeah. It's a mental challenge for me to actually Well, don't speak. worry. You'll get your revenge because the game we've selected next, I'm going to play that. And it is one of the hardest games on the system. Yes, by far <laughs> one of the hardest games. So I look forward to that. I look forward to embarrassing myself uh, on this recording. Oh, I do that on every recording we do, so that's fine. That's all right. So, yeah, come on. You can get through this. Yes, I'm just being careless with one of these enemies here. This one, I think. Yeah, yeah. By just taking him out, it's a little bit easier. By the way, there's a gun, the machine gun here. Uh, somewhat unusual for a Japanese game to have um, kind of these realistic-looking machine guns right. in the game. Uh, gun loss in Japan is very strict. That's true. It is interesting again that like the even these enemies they have so many frames of animation. Right. It's really quite fascinating to see. Uh, now one thing they don't do is they don't scroll the screen up, so it's only a left and right play field, which is uh, definitely a, a choice made to because actually doing a full free scrolling screen is pretty difficult on the system, or it requires some uh, sacrifices. Who have to basically be a Nintendo to pull that off? I mean, there's uh, other games that pull it off, of course, but it has its own, you know, that's one of the reasons why, like, Super Mario Bros. 3 has all that sort of garbage around the edge of the right. screen and the view area is smaller because it's, you know, it's, it's related to how they're scrolling the screen. So, but it, it kind of works in this game, I suppose, since you're kind of moving up in chunks. I really love that double jump, by the way. It's so satisfying. Can you double jump off the screen? 
Yeah, oh. we can do this. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, see this. And we got the clouds back again. Oh, these clouds. They're so good looking. But to here, John, you have the clouds and the slopes. That's right. Well, see, slopes on the Famicom and NES, pretty common. It's more like Game Boy where I'm like, <laughs> you know, it's the Game Boy, you don't see that many slopes. And when you do, it's really exciting. And wait, was that like an, a chimpanzee with a knife? Uh, either that or Mole Men. I'm oh, not okay. really sure. The enemies in this game uh, are kind of wacky. So... I like this guy. My favorite enemy is probably the the girl with the bow. She's really well animated. She was in the game earlier, so on oh, stage yeah, yeah. one. And she almost looks like she should be one of the main characters due to how well she animates. So it's kind of hard sometimes to see the difference between. Oh. That's an interestingly large boss sprite. I wonder how many meta tiles they're using to, to build that boss. Took him out pretty quick. Wow, that's cool. Okay, let's see what the next stage looks like. We'll play a little bit more of this, and then we'll move on to game number two. It's fun to do these gauntlets of Famicom. Uh, Famicom is probably the one console I collect the most. Yeah, you have an impressive collection of Famicom. I'm about 300, yeah. It's absurd. <laughs> it is quite absurd. I think you can skip forward, though. Yes. This is cool, but... Oh, okay, it's just a stark black background. Right. Now, that is odd, actually, that they would... Okay, I see what they're doing. Yeah, we're going up into the sky, so it changes a little bit here. It is moment. something that does create Oops. kind of a mood These when you have NES games with these stark black backgrounds. This screen in particular just reminds me of like Wizards and Warriors a little bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's see, there okay, you go. There you go. Ah! It does remind me of Wizards and Warriors. Because I keep falling down? Yeah. I was never a big fan of Wizards and Warriors, uh, nah. those games. I never liked them. See, those trees look very Mega Man to me. A little bit. There's In a, a good lot. way. I like yeah. I like the Mega Man. Man, there's so many frames of animation in that enemy, too. Like, it really... I mean, that's clearly where this game excels. It's just the animation quality. I think we've said it, like, 50 times already, but right. you know, I, I just keep seeing it. Like, man, look at that. I just love this take on kind of the cinematic platformer. I guess that's the name of them now. Uh, back in the day, I just called them Prince of Persia games. Uh, I, but you, you <laughs> yeah. really like, this. This feels so different to me. Like I see why why you'd say that, but it it feels pretty different to me. So it is different, and that's what makes it so interesting to me. It's just oh, I think see. the only similarity to those would be the mantling, and like the focus on smooth animation. I think right? the rotoscoped animation and just a little bit of the puzzle solving here. Uh, later in the game, you really get into that, but uh, there is a lot more to it than just the you know these few examples we see here so the puzzle here so okay yes, that's pretty cool the double jump i was waiting for it to come back Got oh shoot oh these are those platforms that sort of no you were freaked out by that thing yes it's it hideous. was pretty hideous okay so game over i think it's a good yeah, time to Count castle pretty good well yeah your verdict on this game I'm you haven't impressed. seen too much of it I'm very impressed, but I'm trying not to get too excited about it because I don't plan to own a copy. It, it is quite expensive. I got yes, very lucky for I'm my aware contacts. I could play ROM. Yes, but that's but not what this is all about. It's not what this is about for me. It's, it's a know, lot more fun to discover these games on exactly, cartridge. Exactly. Your mileage may vary. It's true. But of course, I am going to pull out another game in just a moment here. And this one comes in a very special case. Let's look at it. It's a Sunsoft game. And yes, we're talking about Dynamite Batman, or Batman Return of the Joker, Return I think Return of the Joker on the NES, and Revenge of the Joker on the Genesis. So this is a game, I think I've talked about this before in various videos, but I've never really spent a lot of time focusing on it, and I just right. want to do that because, to me, this is uh, one of the most impressive 8-bit games ever made. Just the Where amount of detail on display, the quality of the artwork... Uh, there's cool clouds up there, which is similar to Moon Crystal, except for these are actually done with animated tiles, which allows them to exist within levels and intersect with buildings. Because uh, if you go back to the Moon Crystal sky, you'll notice how the clouds are always sort of above the level right. because they don't intersect with anything because it's they're just manipulating it on sort of a scanline basis, doing like scanline interrupt tricks, basically. Uh, whereas here... So when they would do that, obviously, you would have to have the background and foreground sort of separate, which limited what you could do with level design. Obviously, they didn't want that here, so they used sort of an animated tile trick. That's why they also updated it half rate. Or basically, it looks like 30 frames per second versus 60 of the foreground. 
but it's still a good trick. I like it. This game is interesting also because this actually has a special chip inside, which for U.S. cartridges was uh, no no. Yeah, but this one right. does. This uh, one does. I forget what the name of it, but it's one of the Sunsoft uh, helper chips. I mean, the mappers were one thing, which technically, you know, did help the console go beyond what it was supposed to do. But this one has an extra Sunsoft chip in there. That's so, right. But, I mean, this looks. Uh, you know, this could very well be a 16-bit game early on. Uh, oh, there's yeah. some limitation in color, but, I mean, animation-wise... Uh, but actually, and, the limitation in color is one of the things that I love about it, is it yes. really showcases the creativity. Like, just look at what's going on here. You it have that beautiful insane. purple sky, then that, that stripe of the orange sky behind it, but then yeah. look at the bridges on that tower in the background. The, there's long shadows that come fade into the middle of the tower you have those windows with sort of the flames dancing in there the little torches along there just the way the 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 graphics sort of move into the shadow it's really really beautiful the, this thing here also is that sunsoft when they did the first batman game kind of always did this they faded into black really well with the backgrounds and the detail so it's really cool to see them take this to another level here because this might be just the most graphically impressive game of the system. It's when up it takes there. Everything it's really into up account. there for sure. It's also brutally difficult. It yes, gets, I... it gets to be insane. I managed to finish it this year for the first uh, time. That's right. Yeah. But yeah. trying to do it while recording. That's uh, not going to happen. Not going to happen. It's interesting because it's a shooter game, basically. I mean, the first one is uh, melee combat, Ninja Gaiden style, you know, platformer. Yeah, yeah. That's probably a little more Batman than this one. To be honest, yeah, here I, you're just shooting people. I've always kind of thought that maybe this was one of those games that was something else. Yeah, this has been my favorite for years. Batman. Yeah, my favorite for years has been that this design started as another game, and then because they had the Batman license still, uh, they repurposed it. Because technically, I believe they also did this for the uh, PC Engine game. That that's also right. very much looks to have been a very different game. That's that's where Batman literally takes out the trash. He takes out the trash quite literally, and it's many years after the film at that point. So, this is interesting no. though. The oh. heart was right there. <laughs> this is also interesting because this is a sequel to the Batman video game based on the film, but it's not Batman Returns, which was coming out on the NES at the same time ish by Konami. So uh, this is a continuation of kind of like the first movie, but only strictly in the video game sense. This was kind of late in the life of Sunsoft, and they were. I really loved a lot of Sunsoft's later games, and they they became pretty rare, I think, over time. Yeah, the problem with Sunsoft was that I think uh, leadership changed from uh, Japanese to U.S. There was a lot of investment from the U.S. side. And I think the way that they develop and publish games changed a lot when the 16-bit era came in to uh, be more effective. And I think this uh, really did a number on them, unfortunately. I think yeah. technically the name is still around. There's a holding company that kind of... Oh, used, ooh, I forgot. The he Mega Man the slide. slide. But I think, yeah, I think there is a company around still called Sunsoft that's kind of like a holding company uh, for that's these true. licenses. Not this one in particular, but the uh, Blaster Master and such. And Blastmaster has come back thanks to Integrates because uh, they've been making some wonderful games. That's true, Blastermaster. Zero. Both, both of those games, Zero and Zero Two, yep. which is a weird thing to say, by the way. <laughs> yes. Like zero, Zero Two. The producer on that is a good friend of ours, Matt That's Papa. True. Matt so Papa. Giving shout him a out shout Matt. out. We should have him on the show one day playing Blastermaster, don't you think? I agree. You did a really good video on Blastermaster. It's very early. Yeah, that was early in the world of DF Retro. I love that video. So people watching this, please watch that because I think you did a really good job explaining a lot of Sunsoft's uh, uh, quality in that You always video. hear about Blastermaster, but I feel like it's weirdly kind of overlooked these days. Uh, yeah, yes and no. I think now people have started to kind of reconnect with them due to those new games. Man, okay, so we got through it. First <laughs> boss is coming up. Now I have to beat this boss here. Oh, let's see. oh yeah, he just calls him dudes. So how does the bo boss battle? Oh, so there's a power gauge now. Yeah, it's, it works differently. Like a reverse Smash Brothers? Actually, yeah, you can kind of take <laughs> some damage in the boss battles that normally wouldn't. So the boss can, battles I can are... kind of cheese them up until there's a point. Like after the, I think once you get to that tank, yeah, the, when you fight the Joker at that point, uh, you start to need to really play carefully. In the final boss battle, oof. 
I haven't played this game that much since it released, basically. That's a pretty cool shot, though. That is a cool shot. It's a t-shirt, if yeah. I ever saw one. Also, the music in this game is incredible. Yes, I mean... But it's Sunsoft. Again, just look at the quality of their shading here. It's, wow. Uh, it's so beautiful. So we're getting, uh, because we're playing on the NT Mini, we're getting some of the overscan here, though. Yeah, uh, so that's one thing is for capture, I'm actually playing on the OLED TV, which also makes it slightly more difficult. I mean, there's only like a little over one frame of lag extra, mm -hmm. but that actually, makes, in this game makes <laughs> quite play, the difference. Playing a game like this on such a large screen, like going from 20 to 65 inches like this, it's too big. Like, I don't think these retro games play great on large screens. No. They play fine, but there is definitely a case to be made. <sighs> that uh, it gets too big and it's hard to follow the whole picture. Yeah, because you really need, your eyes need to be so aware of the whole image. And when it's this big, you know, it's not the same as a modern game. Well, except for some retro games, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like modern retro games. <laughs> Though they are usually designed to take that into account, which these games are not, so. That's true. And are widescreen with smaller sprites. Yeah. Oh um, yeah, see, look at this, this part. They have all this sort of parallax tricks going on. It's a really cool looking shooter segment. So I noticed here you have a charge shot too. That's right. You only have it with certain weapons, I think. Yeah. Although for this section, I think you just have it. It's been so long since I've seen this game, other than like snippets here and there just to show off the graphical oh, did. quality. Oh, yeah. Well, okay, let's do this again. Par for the core in this game. Oh, yeah. Let's wait for the ice stage. That's when it gets bad. Oh yeah, yes, the snow level. So your your normal pea shooter, by the way, is so weak, and this is actually this is what makes that boss uh, after the tank so difficult because if you make it to the Joker without a weapon, uh, and you just have your pea shooter there, it makes the fight ten times more difficult. It takes forever to get through. See, they have these gradius-like patterns. Even right. Though I'm doing terrible at dealing with them. <laughs> <laughs> detail here though is just uh, like so gorgeous on even the enemy here just it's so well done you're probably hearing a ton of clicking in the microphone now <laughs> that's that I think fine about it. the just intense gaming the that just fills the air with atmosphere for the people watching this but yeah i just love the look of this game just the, oh like the Batmobile. Batmobile. so we mentioned earlier i mean this kind of looks like a 16-bit oh, game oh no oh you're here it's this is the pot this is the spark Ugh, you're going to have to be like play-by-play -play commentary as I become very upset. So, All right, I'll first try of my all, best. It's, okay, that's problem one. You have to learn, you where know, the bombs each time are. you play, you kind of got to remember <laughs> where the bombs are going to fall because they they fall. Okay. Oh, the, you got the guys. Kabuki. Uh, look at that. Yeah. So basically, you kind of have to learn not to take any hits for this, which when I did manage to finish this game i actually had this down where it's like you knew exactly where these things were going to hit and i don't remember them because it doesn't make sense and also here like see i have three live three lives uh like life points left yeah it's not enough so how long did it take you to actually beat this game when you did like uh, how many three hours okay but i played it hard that day <laughs> so yeah well i was mentioning the 16-bit thing uh, this actually did have a 16-bit conversion eventually oh, yes, it did. on Mega Drive, and it's insane to me to think that like this is an 8-bit game. Uh, if you play the 16-bit games, they look worse, sound worse, worse, play worse, uh, which comes down to the fact that I believe they were done by American Studio. They were. Uh, yeah, so those games are not worth playing at all. Uh, no offense to the people who made it, but just uh, I guess they had uh, some trouble getting this converted over. My guess is that, like we often see with Japanese companies, is they didn't have access to the source code no. or any of the art files, and they were like tasked with a very difficult project. Like you just need to make this game again, and we're not giving you any of the source materials. Yeah, it's not very good. There was a Super Nintendo port of that planned as well, but that was canceled. I think the beta ROM is out there somewhere. Uh, I have never played that beta ROM to see if it's different from the Mega Drive, but I'm guessing no. So you're using the charge shot here. 
Yeah, so the charge shot actually sometimes, if you're lucky, <laughs> can seem to block these napalm drops. So as soon He's as so slow on the ice too. Yeah, as soon as that enemy appears, not only does he appear, but he shoots straight at you. So you have to have immediate <gasps> reaction. I Michael. did it. You did it. You made it. Now we got conveyor belts and torture. <laughs> so this game just gets worse and worse in terms of difficulty. Um, was that a boulder? Yeah, there's. A, I forgot about those. It's definitely one of those games where you gotta play it to learn it. Like you can't. It's. It's doesn't. It's almost impossible to respond to the challenges on your first try. You really kind of have to understand what's coming and react to it. So it is. It's one of those. Also, like, like it. When you naturally play, that's what happens. So you really have to anticipate. get into the zone and yeah. This is a CRT game, though. When you look at this, I mean. Yeah. Okay, we're we're actually gonna screw this and put in a password. <laughs> GPZT. Ah, look at this. Just look at all that movement. The clouds, all the, the foliage there moving, there's trees. Like, it's just... Like, it's hard to believe that this is actually an 8-bit game, I think. Just the quality of everything on display. Look at that. This pushes everything to the limit of the, what the NES can do, for sure. Just look at the, and the fact that it goes behind these pillars as well. That stupid end weapon, which is just <laughs> whatever that means. It's just it creates this like that, and it, you you can't hit your enemy. The, the weapon system oh, is wait. very similar to Fester's Quest. Oh yeah, that's actually which is also point. Sunsoft. Wow, so we got some flicker here, which I, I actually uh, flicker hasn't been too much of like, an issue so far in the no, game. No, they do a good job at avoiding it. Oh yeah, look at that, how they, they do this this weird trembling of the background layer. Right. It's really cool. There was another game on the Famicom that was kind of known for doing this stuff, and that was the Metal Storm. That's but right. I think I never liked that effect. No, not they in that They use the game. same technique, but I don't like the way they do it in So, that. you know what? It's very hot. This game is kicking my butt right now, so let's move on to our final game. Let's do it. All right, so what is this? So this is a pretty new game, 2019, as you can see, from Impact Soft in Japan. Uh, this is Haradius Zero. Uh, have you ever heard of it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Uh, this is basically a game that started its life on the MSX, uh, MSX2, I believe, and uh, has been ported over to the NES here or the Famicom. And already here, you can see a lot of things happening on screen at once. So yeah, I think that's what impresses me the most about this. So yeah, you have the star field in the background, which looks cool, but it's... There's so many enemies that appear on screen, and right. due to their placement and the way that they're handling it, there's like really no flicker or slowdown. No, not much at all. I mean, this uh, it reminds me a little bit of like the games that came late, like Rekka and these kind of very impressive yeah, yeah, yeah. games. Yeah, they were really good at that. Uh, that was more of a fast game than here. There's more detail on screen, I think, at the same time. But uh, yeah, this is. Uh, I thought this was such a cool game when I got to play test it before release. That I had to pick up a copy when they finally released it. And yeah, this is actually, it may be a newer game, but this has a real physical cartridge, doesn't it? Yes, it did. Uh, it was released in Japan, very uh, quite limited numbers. I know that they announced, in fact, that there will be a U.S. release coming of this. Uh, so that's kind of cool that it will be available for American customers pretty soon. Uh, but uh, this... Um, it's really cool to just see how... Because this already pushed the MSX, obviously. Uh, it was a bit of a different game on there, I believe. Uh, in terms of just how it uh, did scrolling and whatnot. But uh, a new shooter on the NES, we don't see that too often. So this is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. I love this. It's very uh, <coughs> Gradius. A, a little bit. Uh, maybe the name also kind of hints at that. I believe the US name is going to be changed from what I saw on Twitter. But, but honestly, though, I mean, the, the this gameplay mechanic. Yes, you have the options in Gradius, but mm -hmm. they don't really function like this. Although in Gradius 5, you can lock them. But this being able to like bring them in and out like this is pretty cool. Just look at the number of sprites that came on screen there as quickly and no no real flicker. So really impressive. Here you have the boss, which I'm pretty sure oh. uses background tiles. Or do you think this is sprites? Uh, probably background tiles. Yeah. Oh, so geez. probably shooting that little... little uh, core there shoot the core 
Another thing I think you liked about this game, John, was the fact that it came in a small case, much like the Sunsoft games. Yeah, it's a different type of case, but yes, it all it's similarly small. It's about the same size. We put them next to each other, and it kind of fits if you uh, squint your eyes a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> I like the star feel here, too, moving to uh, uh, two separate speeds. Yeah, look at all these sprites. See, that? that's just crazy for the NES slash Famicom. Yes. Well, now that it is coming out on the NES, we can still call it an NES game. So yeah, uh, this has been very... Uh, I'm a huge fan of homebrew games on the Famicom and Mega Drive, and I usually pick up most of the ones I can, be it the Kickstarter or via these stores. In Japan, uh, I also had some involvement in some of them, I, I won't mention which, but uh, some release in Japan I had some involvement in, and it's been really interesting to me to see uh, just the growth of that market the last few years, because I started doing this stuff back in the mid-2000s with the chiptune community, and uh, now I'm seeing all these like new releases. It's uh, quite a uh, spectacle to see for me. Yeah, it's really cool. Especially when you get to fly through the Mario pipes. <laughs> yes, uh, this very much looks like the Mario pipes, but it's also very gradius still, these kind of fields. Uh -oh. oh, I was trying to get that power. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Too many bullets. <laughs> Not quite bullet hill, but... <laughs> Not quite. Yeah, so you're much better at shooters than me. Some slow down here yeah. uh, for the first time. There's too many seen. sprites. Yeah. You're not killing them fast enough. Okay, whoa. This is crazy. Oh, what the heck is going on? Yeah, well, I'm not sure what shot you there, but... There's, there's like these weird nebula... Okay, this is... This is actually kind of hard to parse. Especially on a flat screen, as big as it is. Uh, our eyes have to move a little bit too much. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you're doing a really good job. I, I had trouble beating the first stage. <laughs> Look at that. So here you have to use your options. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's really cool that they integrate these gimmicks this way. Oh, just look at that pattern too. I, I love this game for all the stuff that it's doing. So is oh, there any... Hey, it's the same boss again. <laughs> yeah. But he's a different color. Oh, and different, different pattern. pattern. Is there any other homebrew game that you have noticed? I know you picked up a few after we kind of started talking about them. Uh, I mean, mostly, you know, stuff on the Mega Drive. Yeah. You sign of Crisis. Yeah, Zeno Crisis, Tanglewood, and all that kind of stuff. Let me lean over and look at your... I can actually see your NES collection from here. Oh, yeah. I have, uh, Micromages. Uh, Micromages. Very good homebrew game. That one, actually, Excellent yeah. choice, John. Friend of the show, Thomas Nickel, brought that over once, and oh, I yeah, picked yeah. up a copy. Very good, yeah. I love that game too. So, and Mega Cat Studios is doing good stuff. There's a lot of these new studios doing NES games these days. So it's a fun, yes, this it's is a true. fun community to uh, look into. Maybe one day we'll do like a DF retro about new modern retro games. I agree. Okay. Oh, 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 oh. Noticing also, you actually have sort of like a life bar. You can't see it, but you can actually take more than one hit. Yeah, this is not quite like Gradius in that sense. Which shooters let you take more than one hit, like, that are famous? Oh, um, that's, that's actually... it's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> usually what happens is there's two ways. Either you die immediately and go back to a checkpoint, or right. you take a hit and die, but you just continue, right, it just respawns you immediately. And you lost your uh, options yeah. or something. I generally prefer, honestly, the Gradius type, even though it is kind of harder uh, I do like sort of having to respawn because it forces you to learn. You know what I mean? Right. It's like it's a way to teach you how to play the game because you're not going to get past a part. You can't just like button your way through something. And that that makes it far more rewarding, for me at least. Yeah. So even though I'm really bad at shooters, I'm surprisingly good at Choniki, which is a shooter which is extremely difficult. I think this always perplexes you. Yeah, I mean, it's probably <laughs> you just enjoy the visuals enough. That... Yes. Oh, jeez. And I you finally died. died on stage three. Okay, well, that... That's pretty impressive, that's isn't pretty it? pretty darn impressive. And I think we've seen pretty much what it has to offer. But yeah. kind of a fun bonus game to check out here at the end. Uh, I like it. It's it's a cool, cool game, cool experience. And uh, I don't know if you guys want to see more what we think at least are technically impressive Famicom NES or 16-bit games doesn't matter anything yeah you know let or more let homebrew know. like this uh, yep. I have homebrew quite the collection also okay yeah so but yeah if you guys enjoyed this video as always be sure to like subscribe all that stuff uh follow us on Twitter we're there 
And yeah, if you have any cool homebrew games yourselves, don't hesitate to let us know. Yeah. And until next time, stay retro. Finally, a headset that can be as expressive as you. G733 is wireless and designed for comfort, and it's outfitted with all the surround sound, voice filters, and advanced lighting you need to look, sound, and play with more style than ever. Lightspeed wireless technology lets you game wirelessly without compromises in latency, connectivity, or battery. Play in complete freedom with over 20 hours of battery life and a range of up to 15 meters. 